Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, uh, the uh, Seattle Neurology Grand Round uh, hosted by the Seattle Science, Science Foundation. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Kuhn, uh, who's an associate professor of neurology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She has um, graciously accepted to educate us on autonomic failure and Parkinsonism today. Dr. Kuhn received her medical degree at the University of Iowa and then completed her residency at Mayo Clinic where she served as chief resident. She went on to complete fellowships in movement disorders and then a Mayo Clinic scholar year in autonomic disorders. Uh, Dr. Kuhn is currently um, the program director of the adult neurology residency program. She also serves as autonomic disorders fellowship director at Mayo Clinic and as the chair of the UCNS Autonomic Disorders Examination Committee and American Academy of Neurology Autonomic Disorders Section Vice Chairs. That's a lot of hats, Dr. Kuhn. Um, and uh, Dr. Kuhn also co-founded the MSA Clinic at Mayo uh, and serves on the MSA, which is Multiple System Atrophy Coalition Medical Advisory Board. Another of Dr. Kuhn's interests is the history of neurology. She has served as vice chair of the history of neurology section for the American Academy of Neurology and has also received the prestigious A.N. Lawrence C. McHenry Award for history of neurology. She is the author of numerous uh, publications, several of which have shaped the course of evaluation and treatment of autonomic disorders. Um, and she's also the proud mother of four boys and loves to run and bike uh, in her free time, especially with her boys. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kuhn, please take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity uh, and to talk is particularly about autonomic failure and Parkinsonism. So really my, my two clinical loves coming together. Uh, and so uh, no disclosures. And these are the objectives for today. We're going to hopefully go through these testing approaches for the autonomic nervous system. Look at the different forms of autonomic failure that we can see in Parkinsonism and then describe treatment regimens. This is how we will get through that. And I first want to start um, by saying, you know, why is this important? And, and can I make sure, are you all seeing the big slide or are you seeing the presenter view? We're seeing the, the big slide. There was a little bit of disturbance with the audio, but that could just be the connection. Uh, but, but please go ahead. We can see the slides and we can hear you okay. Sounds good. Please let me know if anything gets disrupted. So, you know, why is this important? So we know that autonomic dysfunction is so common in various stages of Parkinsonism. So the prevalence of orthostatic hypotension in Parkinson is reported from 30 to 65% and really increases as the disease progresses. But uh, what I also wanna show today is that this autonomic failure can come at any time in this course of Parkinsonism. And that can give us clues to the diagnosis uh, and give us uh, really some ways that we can also help the patient clinically. What is also important though, is that this autonomic dysfunction correlates with worse quality of life. And some of these studies have even shown that the autonomic dysfunction and some of these other non-motor findings have a greater impact on patients than the motor findings, particularly in patients with Parkinson's disease. So what do I mean when I say autonomic dysfunction in Parkinsonism? So this autonomic dysfunction is a big term, and I'm going to specifically use autonomic dysfunction and then autonomic failure. So autonomic dysfunction is a broad umbrella term for autonomic signs and symptoms that can be affected, whereas autonomic failure really is if there's been damage to these autonomic pathways and manifestations of that. I tend to avoid the term dysautonomia. This is a term that has a lot of different meanings and different meanings for different people. Um, so we'll avoid that and predominantly use autonomic dysfunction and autonomic failure. If we can see the variety of categories that can affect our patients with Parkinsonism, particularly cardiovascular with orthostatic hypotension, which will be a big part of this talk, but then gastrointestinal extremity changes, thermal regulation. So we know that some patients uh, with Parkinson's disease 
part of their on and off phenomena may be sweating episodes. And this can give us clue to how to adjust their medications. But also uh, anhydrosis and compensatory hyperhidrosis, and these different patterns can guide us towards uh, the diagnosis. Genital urinary dysfunction is also very common in our patients. And again, the different patterns can give us clues to the underlying disorder. There's also importance in looking at the autonomic nervous system because of understanding the pathophysiology. So there's a lot of interest right now in this gut-brain axis, and it's been proposed as the starting point for cyanoplanopathy, specifically Parkinson's disease. As you can see in this publication here, how thought that different changes in kind of gut barrier, bacteria, inflammation, that then leads to this uh, alpha synuclein traveling up the vagus nerve as that highway to the central nervous system. I think that's exciting. And there's definitely more work that needs to be done to really elucidate this path, uh, this pathway if it's true. But it also kind of brings into mind things that we see, that we know that patients with Parkinson's disease may have decades of GI involvement, specifically constipation based on epidemiologic work. And it also goes along with more of this Brock hypothesis that posits that the enteric nervous system is the start of the spread and can go to the various levels. But that doesn't quite explain the whole story as we talk about the different presentations of autonomic nervous system involvement in Parkinsonism. Um, so let's step back a bit and, and center more on this autonomic nervous system anatomy and how we approach it from a testing angle. So anatomically, we have this central autonomic network. You can see there's a lot of overlap between various Parkinsonian disorders. This central autonomic network is an essential component of the internal regulation system by which the brain controls a number of different things. Uh, it has level specific functions such as behavioral awareness, integration with arousal and pain modulation, blood pressure uh, control with the bar reflex in the brainstem. And then we have these segmental, segmental uh, sympathetic responses coming through the spinal cord. So now let's look at um, more of the pathways that come from that central autonomic network. And we specifically delineate into the sympathetic pathways, which are the thoracolumbar, go to the cranial organs, the heart, the gut, uh, the bladder, the skin, uh, specifically innervating the sweat glands. And then our parasympathetic pathways too, which is predominantly that cranial uh, sacral area, again, going to those cranial organs with the big vagus nerve doing so much in the heart and, and the GI tract. And you can see this predominantly using that acetylcholine uh, neurotransmitters, which we'll get to when we talk about different medications for assessing and treating these systems. And so we think about that autonomic anatomy when we do our autonomic function testing. And, and here we predominantly do two main things, autonomic function testing, the autonomic reflex screen that involves pseudomotor, cardiovagal, cardiovascular, adrenergic components, and also the thermal regulatory sweat test, which looks at the entire pathway. So first, let's go through this testing because it will come up when we go through more of these clinical disorders. Um, this autonomic uh, Reflex screen has QSART or quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test, which involves uh, an acetylcholine solution in the outer rim of this capsule, which is an iontophorist to uh, activate a sweat gland, which then activates the neighboring sweat gland, which uh, uh, kind of releases sweat, which is then captured in the inner chamber of that capsule. And we look at that response, measuring the area under the curve normalizing to controls. So this is giving us a measure of postganglionic sympathetic pseudomotor function. And then we do cardiovagal testing. And this is looking at heart rate response to deep breathing and Valsalva maneuver. So for the deep breathing, we have patients take big deep breaths, activating that vagus nerve on the exhalation, which then brings down that heart rate. And we measure that heart rate variability of those five consecutive uh, max to min responses. And we can also look at that heart rate response to Valsalva. So here in the bottom, we have a Valsalva in the shaded area that causes these blood pressure changes. 
And then that leads with that blood pressure drop, we see that increase in heart rate. And then once that, that Valsalva is released, that heart rate comes back down and we can measure that max to min with that Valsalva response. We can also look at kind of adrenergic function. So beat to beat blood pressure of the Valsalva, like we just said. So looking at those phases and making sure all those phases are intact to tell us if this adrenergic uh, system is, is, or sympathetic system is functioning. And then we use the tilt. So on tilt, we have patients do a five minute baseline measuring heart rate, blood pressures, and then tilt up to 70 degrees of passive tilt and measuring that blood pressure till tilt back. And that brings us to, you know, this detection of orthostatic hypotension. And so in defining orthostatic hypotension, we're looking for a drop of, of 20 over 10 in systolic over diastolic blood pressure within three minutes of standing. Now you might see differences when patients are on tilt because tilt is more of a passive maneuver. When we're standing, we have our kind of our pumps in our legs, still sending blood pressure up. So we use a 30 over 15 when patients are on a passive tilt. But this classic OH tends to follow this pattern. So we see a, a drop in blood pressure and stays relatively stable throughout compared to a control blood pressure and heart rate here. We're also looking at the heart rate response to that blood pressure drop, and we'll talk a bit more about that. There can be other patterns too, including an initial orthostatic hypotension with a big drop in blood pressure and immediately the normalization. We can see this in people who are you know, volume depleted uh, or medications contributing like levodopa potentially. Uh, and then we have patients with delayed orthostatic hypotension who have kind of preserved blood pressure initially. Then after three minutes, we start to see the blood pressure come down. And there was an interesting study too by uh, Chris Gibbons and Roy Freeman in Boston that showed that in patients with this delayed orthostatic hypotension, about 54% went on to develop classic OH at 10 years of follow-up. And some of those patients did go on to develop motor signs consistent with Parkinson's disease. So it could be an early clue uh, of an underlying disorder. Now, what about neurogenic OH? So I touched that, you know, sometimes medications, hypovolemia can cause OH, but to clue us in that this is really neurogenic OH, um, we, can measure, we can follow that heart rate response. So in addition to following the, the blood pressure curves on Valsalva. And so this was a great study by uh, Lucy Norcliffe Kaufman, um, and the consortium group that showed that in neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, the heart rate response is really blunted. And you can use this ratio. So looking at the change in heart rate uh, over that change in systolic blood pressure. And if that ratio is less than 0.5, that's really diagnostic of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. So it can be great if you have this autonomic function testing really at, at your disposal for patients, but you could easily do this in the clinic and uh, document or diagnose neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And that's really validated by Dr. Fred Chuli as well uh, with doing more st active standing compared to on tilt. So what about this thermoregulatory system? So we can test this entire thermoregulatory axis with the thermoregulatory sweat test. So we do that by um, covering patients in a powder, an alizarin red powder, and then going into a heat box, which is set at uh, probably about uh, um, 120 degrees with a 40% humidity. And we monitor the core temperature rise up to 38 degrees Celsius and look at the sweating pattern. So the powder is yellow and then turns to a purple color when the patients, uh, when it interacts with water, or it sweat. So we can look at the pattern and then the percentage uh, of the body that doesn't sweat or percentage anhydrosis. And this test is really going from the hypothalamus to looking at those peripheral sympathetic pathways, assessing the entire um, pathway. So then we can use that together with the QSART and kind of pinpoint where the lesion is. Is that more of a central? lesion affecting the thermoregulatory pathway versus more of a peripheral lesion that would have more of an abnormal QSART on that autonomic reflex screen. So now 
let's talk with that background. Let's talk more about autonomic failure and Parkinsonism. And a bulk of this will really be on synucleinopathies uh, because uh, these synucleinopathy disorders have a characteristic finding of autonomic dysfunction. Another key thing is this REM sleep behavior disorder. So you can see high percentages of patients have REM sleep behavior disorder characterized by polysomnography. And it is one of these clues that we're dealing with a, a alpha synuclein disorder. In terms of the autonomic dysfunction specifically, we frequently see neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, the genital urinary dysfunction, the constipation we talked about, and then thermal regulatory dysfunction. And sense of smell is often affected in these patients, but I'll separate this by saying that the Lewy body disorders are affected. Patients with MSA tend to have a preserved sense of smell. And since there can be so much overlap between these disorders, they can be difficult to accurately diagnose in the clinic, especially early in disease. So for the next part of this talk, we'll really be focusing on kind of that early diagnosis and different tools that we can use that sort of separate out these different um, disorders that have both Parkinsonism and autonomic failure. So let's go to a case. So this was a 67 year old uh, left-hand dominant farmer. And he said, you know, doc, I just, I am having a hard time uh, farming, driving my tractor. My left hand is, is really shaking. It's been going on for a couple of years. And early on, he'd had a local doc prescribe carbidopa levodopa very appropriately. And he took, he thought up to about one and a half tabs, three times a day, was taking it with meals and hadn't noticed much benefit. So he came now to our clinic and he had, he said his tremor was worse, but he was having additional symptoms too. Like he'd stand up from working and he'd get a bit of wooziness or lightheadedness. In addition to that, he'd also had some bladder changes. So now he was getting up three, four times in the night and had a lot of urgency frequency uh, that affected their, their travel and some of their working in the fields. And on examination, he really had Parkinsonism left side rest tremor, also rigidity, reduced arm swing, a bit of a stooped posture, but preserved uh, uh, retropulsion. Orthostatic vitals in the clinic showed that he stayed pretty stable. So 135 over 74, heart rate 65, and not much of a drop when checked uh, at that three minute interval. He had a DAT scan uh, shown here with that, that blunting of that comma shape that we're looking for specifically on that right patamen. So, you know, think about what is the most likely diagnosis in this gentleman? Is it pure autonomic failure, Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, or is this MSA? Um, and so in this patient, I think he best fits with Parkinson's disease. Uh, he has the motor findings and, and he has some of the classic autonomic features as well. So let's talk about that. Parkinson's disease is common and it, it is increasing with incidence uh, as, as we age. We're familiar with the motor features of the, the Parkinsonism and, and tends and should respond to dopaminergic therapy. I think the issue with our gentleman is that he hadn't been at a high enough dose of levodopa and also hadn't been taking it correctly away from from food, especially the kind of food containing protein, which is why he probably hadn't had that response. And also in our experience too, patients with tremor tend to require a bit higher doses of levodopa to get uh, kind of adequate responses. Now the autonomic involvement in Parkinson's disease tends to involve you know, constipation with this reduced colonic motility, but the bladder is a specific, is specific and often different from what we'll see in some of the other synucleinopathies. So there's a detressor overactivity. And so patients present with frequency and urgency. If you were to do a post-void residual, you'd have low post-void residual volumes, like less than 100 uh, cc's. And this orthostatic hypotension can be really common. Um, and our patient didn't have it in the clinic, but you can imagine if you know, someone is, uh, you know, had dehydrated or kind of overheated, then that could be where orthostatic hypotension is more likely to occur. And it also tends to be more prevalent the longer that someone has had Parkinson's disease. As for the thermal regulatory dysfunction, 
there's these classic uh, kind of hyperhidrosis or off periods that can that can uh, happen when the patients are either wearing off medication or kind of completely off. They can be a clue to, to adjust their medication, specifically levodopa. So let's go to this next case then. So this is a gentleman who is 68 years old and he came to clinic after a syncopal episode. So he was at his grandson's um, soccer game, had been out in the heat and next thing he knew he was on the ground and first responders were, were all around him. He woke up fine and, and didn't require further evaluation but was now coming to be checked out. But on reviewing his past history, there had been some, some dysfunction for a number of years. So eight years of erectile dysfunction and even some nocturnal uh, wetting the bed. He did have a strong history of, of REM sleep behavior disorder, though it had been relatively well controlled on melatonin and clonazepam. And then on neurologic examination, he really had a fully normal exam and on MOCA was also kind of no cognitive impairment. So we did autonomic testing for him. And here on his Valsalvo, we have this a really re significant drop in blood pressure. There's none of that curve up that we saw in those normal controls and not much of that blood pressure recovery time. Yet his heart rate response really looks good. So that cardiovascular function is preserved. It's really more of a selective adrenergic or sympathetic failure problem. Here is his tilt. So just like at the Valsalva predicted, he had a significant drop, but also notice he has pretty high blood pressure here too. So about 180 systolic at that head up tilt, he dropped down into the 80s, kind of compensated a little bit, but stayed low. So really a, a classic orthostatic hypotension picture with not much heart rate response. So only a change in 19 beats per minute over a 66 millimeter drop. So he had a 0.29 ratio consistent with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And this was his thermal regulatory sweat test. So he was kind of diffusely down in about 11% anhydrosis. So what about this gentleman? What would be the most likely diagnosis? PAF? Parkinson's disease, DLB, or MSA. So I would argue that with a completely normal audit, uh, motor examination and just purely orthostatic hypotension fits with pure autonomic failure. So let's talk about PAF. So it is uh, in this synucleinopathy family, it's, it's predominantly peripheral alpha synuclein inclusions. And the key feature is orthostatic hypotension with a tendency for syncope. Now the OH in these patients can often be quite severe with supine hypertension, just as our patient showed. Also can be fairly severe constipation or genital urinary failure. And the autonomic failure may evolve. So I would expect that you know, while the urinary symptoms are fairly mild at this time, that they can be severe, more severe as the disease progresses, often requiring catheterization. And then the thermal regulatory dysfunction tends to increase over time so that there's often high degrees of anhydrosis, and then the body compensates by sweating uh, in the areas that have preserved uh, sweat innervation. One thing I want to highlight, though, is that we need to monitor these patients closely because patients with PAF may later develop motor or cognitive signs indicating this, this progression or phenoconversion. So we looked at that, uh, these patients who present with pure autonomic failure over a 10-year time frame. And of these uh, uh, patients, we included uh, you know, 275 um, that were initially diagnosed with pure autonomic failure. And then at the end of the study, after calling all the patients, see if they had been diagnosed with another neurodegenerative disorder or if they had developed other signs and symptoms, um, the majority stayed this PAF phenotype, but there was a 30, almost a third that phenoconverted. And in our study, about half went to MSA, another half developed a, a Lewy body disorder of Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. 
But what we were interested to know is what were the predictors that showed that these PAF patients were then going to kind of convert or develop these other signs. So we looked at a number of different um, kind of predictors, and you can see that the MSA patients and the PD, DLB patients looked different. Um, and so we highlighted that these subtle motor signs had a really high odds ratio uh, uh, for patients later developing these other disorders. Let me define subtle motor signs. So these were patients who, when they were initially diagnosed with periodontic failure, the clinician said, you know, there's just a touch of rigidity, not enough to be full Parkinsonism, but just something that was noted on their exam, or it could have been um, an upgoing toe. And, and maybe that was because of disc disease or, or something else, but it was in isolation and not enough to meet Parkinsonism criteria um, or, or a cerebellar ataxia. But another thing too is, is looking at the norepinephrine levels. So here, a norepinephrine level over 100, which would be a normal level, also um, was predictive. And that speaks to MSA being more of a central disorder. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. But also the severity of bladder, this REM sleep behavior disorder, and some of the sweat patterns were also important. For the, the Lewy body patients, um, the subtle motor features were also important, but you know, the, the PAF patients tended to look a lot like these PD DLB uh, phenome converters. So our next step was to do a probability calculator because we wanted to do a tool that clinicians could easily do in the clinic and, and give um, information to patients and say, this is what we expect um, with time. So if we do that for our patients and look at the probability of our patient with PAF of later phenol converting to MSA, he has a really low 3% chance, right? He had no motor signs. Um, his norepinephrine supine was 95, so it was low. And, but he did have some more bla severe bladder, so that would be urinary incontinence. So, so but just a 3% chance of converting to MSA. But if we were to do that for a Lewy body disorder, Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies, he has a much higher probability. So almost 50% because of that dream and active behavior and he is a bit older. So in this case, we'd be watching the patient closely for you know, these motor or cognitive signs. And what I'm most hopeful of is that when we do have disease modifying therapies, these would be patients that we could uh, interact and get uh, on the therapies uh, quickly to try and prevent progression. So let's go to our patient. And so he came in eight years later, and uh, his wife really brought him in because he was having difficulty driving in these confusional episodes. Now we see he had a significant drop in his mocha and it was in a pattern consistent with DLB and his PET scan um, kind of confirmed uh, the, the hypometabolism pattern that we would suspect in dementia with Lewy bodies with that preserved cingulate island sign. So that goes along with now the patient meeting criteria for dementia with Lewy bodies with that pure autonomic failure as the, the preceding features. Dementia with Lewy bodies is pretty common uh, and it has these uh, specific um, and progressive uh, cognitive features with predictably uh, that attentional and executive dysfunction and the visual processing deficits. Not all patients develop Parkinsonism, but it can certainly go along with uh, the disorder. And we see, um, again, I would say a more moderate degree of autonomic failure in dementia with Lewy body patients from those who had uh, just Parkinson's disease. Um, the thermoregulatory dysfunction has to have a bit usually a higher degree of anhydrosis uh, is, is something that's been shown in studies. And so now we've talked about Parkinson's disease, we've talked about pure autonomic failure, and we've talked about dementia with Lewy bodies. And these are all in that category of Lewy body disorders. And so an important thing to note about these Lewy body disorders is that they certainly affect that central autonomic network that we talked about, but it tends to have predominantly peripheral autonomic involvement. So if we were to do that QSART, we tend to see some more uh, kind of postganglionic <clears throat> failure. 
um, and that that pattern of autonomic dysfunction fits more with a peripheral disorder, also going along with those norepinephrine levels being a bit on the lower side. So let's go to our next case. So this is a patient of mine, a 64-year-old who came in with gait changes. Really, she said, you know, she was active playing tennis, gardening, but the last three years, she just had more difficulty doing that. She'd have some falls on the tennis court, and then she'd had an episode where she passed out in her garden and neighbors had to come get her. Her examination showed mild Parkinsonism, but she really had pan-cerebellar ataxia, affecting speech, her extremities, uh, her balance. She also had hyperreflexia and upgoing toes. This is her imaging, and you can see their midline cerebellar atrophy. And with that upgoing toes, we just want to make sure that there wasn't, you know, a cervical spine disease too. And, and her spinal cord, as shown here, was really clear. So more of an upper motor neuron pattern uh, localizing. So in this case, what would be your most likely diagnosis? PAF, PD, DLB, or MSA? So she meets criteria uh, for MSA. Uh, and let's look at her autonomic testing a bit more closely. So here uh, on her Valsalva Munu, she had, she had that significant drop, slow recovery up to baseline. She also had some cardiovascular involvement too. She had a kind of more of a delayed, but can, uh, blood pressure drop, uh, but continued to go down meeting criteria for orthostatic hypotension. And again, a flat heart rate response confirming neurogenic OH. This is her thermal regulatory sweat test. And so on QSART, she had beautiful sweat volumes. So that tells us that the peripheral is intact, but on TST, she had global anhydrosis. And she also had this pattern that we see with some preserved hand sweating as well. Um, so it fits with a central pattern uh, between the QSART and the TST. So what about MSA? So, you know, this is less common, it kind of more around the incidence rate of ALS, but gets more common as people uh, go over the age of 50. There are two uh, phenotypes, the MSAP versus the predominantly cerebellar ataxia form. And what is important is that these patients have other symptoms beyond what we see in our Lewy body patients. So upper motor neuron, uh, dystonia, uh, disproportionate uh, anticholis, so kind of a, a chin on chest deformity. The dysarthria is also very unique. It often has a spastic component in addition to the Parkinsonism or the, the cerebellar ataxia. And when these patients are treated with levodopa or an agonist, they often get early and severe dyskinesias. The autonomic failure in MSA tends to be severe and widespread, and can, that can present with a variety of different features, OH, genital urinary failure, sexual dysfunction, and constipation. But I want to highlight that the urinary failure in MSA is different from the Lewy body disorders and that these patients have uh, an atonic bladder. And so they have post void residuals greater than 100, often requiring catheterization. There's also respiratory and sleep involvement with strider, sleep apneas, in addition to the REM sleep behavior disorder. And then uh, the imaging findings are also pertinent. So in MSAP, we tend to see this hyperintensity outside the lateral patamen, shown here in a, in a patient. Um, there can also be low signal on, on uh, gradient uh, echo imaging. And then in when the cerebellum is involved, we get the classic hot cross bun sign, but this is not um, specific just for MSA. What we commonly see is, especially late in diseases, is ponto cerebellar atrophy. So what is the neuropathologic hallmark of MSA? So Lewy body, glial cytoplasmic inclusion, neurofibrillary tangle, or a tufted astrocyte? So I, I talk with my residents about this as they get ready for their in-training exam. So this is a glial cytoplasmic inclusion. So it's separate from this alpha-synucleinopathies and the Lewy body disorders into uh, the GCIs. And so just to highlight, you know, what we see under the microscope in these Lewy body disorders versus the gliocytoplasmic occlusions in MSA. And here you can see that the areas involved in MSA are also different from the Lewy body disorders. There's certainly a lot of central involvement, particularly in the brainstem, and less of that peripheral involvement. And what has really been exciting is this, the field has really expanded 
exploding in this prion-like spread. So this, these prion-like proteins um, can acquire these different conformations that become self-propagating. And what is important is that it's different alpha-synuclein strands are probably playing a role. And that leads to microglial activation, reactive astrocytes, and eventually the degenerating neuron. So in this case, I get this question for you, would a skin biopsy evaluation for synuclein be useful? Yes, no, I'm not sure. I would argue no, not at this time, because this skin biopsies are, are I, I'm really excited about this use to try and identify these synuclein disorders. They're tricky to do. And even in the original studies, um, there has to be you know, the, the way that it's, the thresholds are determined on these specific ratios of amount of synuclein. And it's the strains of alpha synuclein that are likely playing a role and that we just don't have the back ground for that to know exactly what's important. Um, I am optimistic though, because there is a synuclein one study that's doing skin biopsy detection for phosphorylate alpha synuclein. And so this is in progress now. What's unique is that we can order this study uh, for patients that we haven't done confirmatory studies. So I'm looking forward to the confirmatory studies. And then in the future, we may be able to look at you know, confirm a synucleinopathy diagnosis, but also perhaps look at strains to give us better ideas on the type of synuclein. Now I'm going to um, step back and talk about uh, and talk about different studies in MSA. So we have a number of going on right now, both nationally as well as kind of at our institution. So there's a lot of interest in synuclein and targeting synuclein. So you probably saw in Parkinson's disease, we've had now at least three studies targeting synuclein, which have been negative. The thought is that MSA is a little bit different because of the strains and the conformation that targeting it may be more beneficial. And so that is the background for uh, the amulet study that's being done by Lundbeck uh, that we are participating in. And then uh, another study, the Takata or Takeda study will be coming online. We'll learn more about it this fall, be another drug uh, industry supported study. We're also doing a stem cell study, and this is really being led by Dr. Wolfgang Singer and Dr. Lowe. And this is um, a placebo controlled study uh, taking mesenchymal stem cells, so from the patient's own fat cells, taking them into the lab, differentiating them into neuro stem cells, and then injecting them into the interthecal space. Uh, and studies taking place over a year and looking for improvements. This is coming from a phase two study that showed that it was safe and found an effective or found a safe dose of stem cells, but also show that the patients with the specific concentration of stem cells had a relatively stable progression over a course of the study, which was sometimes up to two years. So that's something that also is going on now in terms of a kind of treatment trials for MSA. I want to touch on the tauopathies and highlight this with a case. So we have another 68 year old woman and she presented with dizziness and imbalance. She had a one year history of kind of ill-defined dizziness, some postural features, and it had some recent falls, but also had urinary leakage. Now she'd had it for years since the birth of her children, but it had been worse recently such that she was now losing complete control of her bladder. Her exam really showed mild Parkinsonism and extensor plantar response. And I apologize for the quality of this. It's a research imaging, but here you can really appreciate kind of that midbrain atrophy, but there also is some uh, midline cerebellar atrophy as well. So this is a, a patient with progressive supranuclear palsy that was um, confirmed on autopsy. And if we go to her clinical history, she would meet criteria for MSA. She's got Parkinsonism with urinary failure and incontinence, but there's enough other features that, that make us want to think about PSP. And we know that PSP is one of the most likely misdiagnosed um, disorders uh, with MSA. So this study I, I really like because it, it looked at patients with PSP and compared them to MSA and Lewy body disorders. And so I, I mainly just wanna point out that the, the groups look fairly similar, except the MSA patients were a bit younger. Um, REM sleep behavior disorder was certainly more common 
in the sinucleinopathy patients, but it wasn't absent in those with PSP. The bladder dysfunction was severe in all three groups, as well as the erectile dysfunction uh, in constipation. So there can be a lot of overlap between the autonomic features, specifically kind of the genital, urinary, and, and bowel involvement. So how do we differentiate these two? Um, and I would say that this, then looking at um, blood pressure recordings can be helpful. So you can see that the PSP patients shown here in green had really minimal blood pressure drop. And this was on tilt, but you could also do it in the clinic compared to the Lewy body patients that had much higher degree of blood pressure drop. So there was a pretty clear delineation here that we can separate PSV versus sinucleinopathies using tilt. So um, I, I've been kind of a run through these uh, uh, different sort of presentations, if you will, of autonomic failure and Parkinsonism. And I wanted to kind of graphically show that. So if we think about you know, patients with PD and the autonomic failure shown more in yellow, there's often some mild autonomic involvement early on in the course of Parkinsonism. Uh, and then that tends to increase uh, in severity as the disease progresses. And this is, can be a fairly common finding in PD. You could even extend the autonomic failure out before the Parkinsonism uh, diagnosis. If we think about more of a dementia with Lewy body picture, so these patients tend to have kind of early or cognitive involvement, often a moderate degree of autonomic failure, and the Parkinsonism tends to come later. Um, if you put cognitive involvement up into this, this uh, you know, Parkinson's disease patient, then you get more of the Parkinson's disease dementia, which really looks uh, similar uh, to, to, to DLB. And then we have these patients with pure autonomic failure who just maintain this autonomic failure picture throughout the course of their disease. And I think this is a really interesting group because if we think about them as a sinucleinopathy, they don't go on to develop motor involvement or they don't go on to develop cognitive involvement. Why is that? And, and could we look at them uh, more in depth as a clue to better understanding these disorders? And then we have our MSA patients. So we can have this combination of Parkinsonism and autonomic failure or the uh, cerebellar ataxia and really the autonomic or the motor could, could proceed or, or follow in, in any different pattern. But often we have these red flag features and the findings of this central autonomic uh, involvement or impairment. So that is kind of more of that MSA type picture when we think about the synucleinopathies in general. So now I want to move on from the clinical side and let's talk about treatment. So in first, in terms of orthostatic hypotension, one of the first things we want to do is wean offending agents. But I want you to say, you know, time out here. What about dopaminergic medications? You know, our patients have motor involvement. We want to treat them. Uh, and there have been kind of this associations previously between OH and dopaminergic medications. But really, if you look at it, it's been rarely studied. So I like this systematic review and meta-analysis that just came out this year. And the levodopa has just been really rarely studied. So it's hard to say um, what levodopa does. Our suspicion is that it likely unmasks underlying adrenergic impairment, but the effects are minimal. So now there's a much more push in the field towards giving levodopa because the benefit outweighs the risk. So trying to, to get that motor benefit. And I'll talk about some ways that we could potentially treat um, OH related to levodopa. I worry more about dopamine agonists. So there's been a lot more studies looking at it. Um, and while, you know, I think in high doses, it certainly can in a lot of the studies, it really showed that there wasn't much difference in terms of, uh, placebo versus patients on a dopamine agonist in terms of orthostatic hypotension. So again, that favors treating the patient's motor uh, involvement uh, to, the, to the best that we can do. We also wanna certainly do non-pharmacologic measures. So expanding plasma volume, cold water boluses, recommending about two liters of fluid intake. 
And we can also uh, recommend increase in sodium. And I usually shoot for a goal of about 170 um, milli equivalents uh, in urinary sodium over the course of 24 hours. We do maneuvers to increase blood pressure. So squeezing those legs, uh, sending blood pressure or blood up back up to the head, as well as compression garments and highlighting thigh high and abdominal binders and exercising typically like on a recumbent bike or row machine. And, if, and those are important, uh, but patients may require pharmacologic treatment. I usually say you have to do both. You have to do the non-pharmacologic um, as well, even if you are on treatment. Fludrocortisone is often a good place to start, but you know it can cause supine hypertension and it has a number of other side effects. Minodrin um, is really helpful because it's a alpha one agonist and can raise blood pressure. It lasts for about four hours. So if we think about that, we can use that to our advantage when we have patients on levodopa who get about a four hour response. So you say, take the mitodrine with levodopa. Patients are not to lie flat for four hours because their blood pressure is gonna be up for those four hours that they are on the medication. And that also means that we need to sort of gradiate when they're getting it through the day. So usually first thing in the morning, maybe midday, and then the afternoon, they just have to see where their blood pressures are, if they're still gonna need the, leave, the mitodrine or not. Pritostigmine is helpful because it does not cause supine hypertension. It acts by increasing the acetylcholine in the system at the ganglia. So increasing that sympathetic outflow. It also has kind of a marginal effect on raising blood pressure. So we often use it with mitodrine just to get a, a bit of a boost. And it does have some beneficial side effects in these patients with severe constipation and that it can help with that constipation. Droxidopa is um, kind of a releaser or pro-drug of norepinephrine that can be helpful. It reportedly in this trials did not cause supine hypertension, though I'd say that isn't true in actual clinical practice. So you have to use cautiously. There is also this phenomena of tachyphylaxis, meaning you get the patient on the medication, they do well, you have to, and then they kind of decline after a couple of weeks, so you increase the dose. So you can kind of rapidly get up to the ceiling doses of droxidopa with um, kind of a declining response. So we've been through treatment and we've been kind of this tour through uh, the autonomic failure and Parkinsonism. We've talked about the autonomic testing and how we're looking at different patterns and severity. And then the synucleinopathy specifically showing more the central to peripheral involvement and then went through both the non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic treatments. I do wanna do a plug for our Autonomic Disorders Fellowship. So it's one year UCNS accredited fellowship. And I always tell my fellows best year of their life. Um, but I really want to also uh, give you some resources, particularly on this orthostatic hypotension in Parkinson's disease, including a recent one by one of our uh, recent uh, fellow graduates, Dr. Lamott. Uh, and again, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you this morning, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Dr. Kuhn, for the excellent um, and uh, really enlightening overview on orthostatic hypotension. And I must say, while we're waiting for questions, I really enjoyed your slides. Uh, that is exactly how a presentation should be done. They were not cluttered. The references were excellent. And I really, really like the illustrations, uh, particularly the Alfonsetti and the Benarak illustrations that you, uh, that you then um, basically uh, put your own labels on. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's a great lecture for, uh, for people in all, um, in all levels of training and residency um, you know, fellowship and, and those of us who haven't had uh, a formal education in autonomics and it's basically school of hard knocks here. So, uh, so thank you very much for also doing the fellowship and training the next generation of neurologists and autonomic disorders. Um, the forum is open uh, for questions and we've had a tremendous attendance today, um, virtually people have joined from everywhere. Um, and I'm going to look at the chat box to see if there are any questions or if people can unmute their mics and speak up. Um, uh, either is okay. And while we are waiting for that very first question, I have several, but I'm not going to, to usurp the time. 
Um, I did have a question about the clinical trials you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the stem cell trial and another trial that is going to be available uh, shortly. Now, our patients are very savvy about clinical trials, e even those in the Pacific Northwest, they are willing to travel to Mayo and other places. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the stem cell trial that you're doing, um, the outcomes that you're looking for, and also this other trial called the AMULET trial that I've become recently um, aware of in MSA that is. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the stem cell trial is recruiting now. We actively have patients uh, in um, kind of getting the, the injections and blinded to uh, placebo versus stem cell. Uh, and so that study will probably go on for a number, probably another two years or so. And we are doing two different dose escalations of the stem cell and, and really Wolfgang Singer is, is the lead on that. So um, our, our, you know, we're, I'm always happy to connect you or your patients with the research team so they can be screened. The um, ambulant, it, well, let me go back to some, some reasoning behind this. So one thought is that the, uh, the growth factors in stem cells are playing a role in sort of helping to stabilize the neuronal loss that occurs in MSA. So that is sort of the thought. And in the original study, uh, Dr. Singer showed there was an increase in some of these uh, growth factors in patients who received in the spinal fluid who received stem cells. So that's sort of the background for the rationale of that trial. And it also had had a positive trial done in Korea before and with a different methodology. Now, the other study amulet is focusing more on the alpha synuclein and targeting alpha synuclein. And um, I, I, that is, is also ongoing, actively recruiting. Takata will be coming on board. And then, um, so we, I don't have much information on that, but I believe it also is a sort of alpha synuclein targeting. And then there's another one that's being run by um, Dr. Klassen, Daniel Klassen at Vanderbilt is doing the alterity trial, which is again, another alpha synuclein targeting drug. Uh, so, and that's a multi-site trial as well. So there's a lot of things right now, which is exciting. Where we often come into play is that the studies have specific um, UMSARS requirements, so really early MSA patients. So if they are more advanced, um, like above, like UMSARS-1 of 11, or uh, then, then they may not qualify. So it's really early patients who are being targeted in these trials. So doctor, because there are not very robust biomarkers in these diseases, do you believe that the UMSAR scale is a good suitable scale to measure outcomes? I think it is given we don't mm -hmm. have other biomarkers. I was just wondering what your personal take on the yeah. UMSAR is. I think it's okay. I think that a lot, and so this goes into FDA is looking at um, more clinically relevant and patient sort of responses. So a lot of it is the UMSARS-1, which is the patient reported. UMSARS-2 is our motor examination um, scores. It's a bit swayed towards different types, uh, like tremor, Parkinsonism forms for the motor side. So there's actually a kind of ongoing now, there, there's going to be an update to the UMSARS. So, so I, I expect it will get better, but it, you know, it, it, it's hard because we don't have biomarkers, just like you pointed out. Um, one more question, um, because there, I don't see that I'm, I'm taking up anybody else's time. The goal of these treatments is to reduce that abnormal alpha synuclein in the brain but the measurement is a clinical scale. Yes. Are we able to determine if these drugs or these therapies are actually doing what they're intended to do in the brain? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is the you know, multi-million dollar question right now is, is targeting synuclein, and, and this really expands into Parkinson's disease too, is targeting synuclein enough? And, you know, in... in and so I think that is, is a huge question. And I know that we're working also on imaging biomarkers to see if we can see imaging changes that would suggest either a, you know, a, a stability um, in relation to, to some of these treatments.
There's also um, some biomarkers being looked at too in spinal fluid, like uh, NFL, a neurofilament mm -hmm. light change, light chain. Um, so that's definitely of interest. And then there's also looking at the synuclein oligomer itself too. So um, the specific types, but I don't know if like levels itself are going to correlate. And I'm assuming that those might be measured in the blood itself, uh, those oligomers. That's the goal. I think That's that nice. right now, at least the work we're doing here, and again, this is um, this is kind of Wolfgang Singer's work, is that it's, it's CSF biomarkers looking at the um, the synuclein oligomers, but ideally it'd be in the blood too. Got it. We have one question, um, Dr. Kuhn, in the couple minutes that are remaining. Um, uh, Brian Goodell asks, if the, um, the clinical presentation that is, is predominantly tremor and cognitive lapses, plus minus autonomic symptoms, when do you start treatment and what are the endpoints to measure? And I suspect it's um, treatment that is probably geared to uh, autonomic um, function because each of those may have different treatments, tremor, cognitive lapses, and um, autonomic dysfunction. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I think this is would be where, you know, partnering with a patient and saying, you know, which of these is most problematic to you? What is keeping you from, from uh, having a higher quality of life or keeping you from doing the things that you love and then targeting the therapies that way? And one thing that I can envision is if it is a motor or a tremor and, and you, you start the patient on say levodopa and you escalate the dose, you know, maybe you may have some increase of that orthostatic hypotension. That's where you know the levodopa, if it was really helpful and you wanna maintain that response, you could use mitodrin to help target the OH. Um, if it is more the cognitive involvement than going down the route with, you know, say acetylcholinesterase inhibitor like a, you know, uh, uh, dinepazil, may be indicated first. But there is, there is a lot of uh, kind of different options depending on the patient's main complaint. And I would say if there's autonomic, certainly doing those non-pharmacologic measures is going to be recommended. Um, that's exactly, that is so true. It's a multidisciplinary approach and you got to meet the patient where the patient is. Um, uh, I do also know that acetylcholine receptor uh, esterase inhibitors can worsen autonomic dysfunction in a small number of people. So I try to focus on the autonomic a little bit to stabilize it so people can tolerate medicines for the motor and the cognitive ability. Sometimes it feels like putting the cart before the horse, but I, but I really think that the, the autonomics becomes the central uh, thing to treat uh, in order to increase medical medicine tolerance at least. Absolutely, I, I like that. So setting up the patient for uh, success. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kuhn. It was really lovely having you. Thanks for your time. And uh, I and I'm sure people in the audience feel uh, so much more educated on autonomic disorders after this lecture. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank and, you. Thank uh, you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.